wat ons gedoen het, het ons vir Suid-Afrika gedoen. Our policy is one which is called by an Afrikaans word apartheid. It could just as easily and perhaps much better be described as a policy of good neighborliness. Accepting that there are differences between people. Regardless of what the martial law administrators do, the masses of our people in these areas will continue to fight for our emancipation. We believe that in our country there shall be no minority, there shall be no majority, there shall just be people. And those people will have uh, the same status before the law. My father and his comrades at Portsmouth Prison send their greetings to you, the freedom-loving people of this our tragic land, in the full confidence that you will carry on the struggle for freedom. I am now in a position to announce that Mr. Nelson Mandela will be released. If we look at the future, I believe that the election will lay a basis for real reconciliation in South Africa. The dawn of our freedom, snaking queues from cities and sprawling townships to far-flung villages, an air of excitement and expectancy. We sincerely hope that uh, by the mere casting of a vote, the result will give hope to all South Africans. The sun shall never set on so glorious a human achievement. Let freedom reign. God bless Africa. We're here where the Freedom Charter was, was actually, actually signed. Well, how would South Africa go through a very similar process in, in today's day and age? You think about the abject poverty that a lot of the, the charterists uh, yeah. came from, you know, the Congress of the People. If you had to be able to put something together that... that all the basis of everything, and, you know. And it looked past all the barriers, the racial barriers, the economic barriers. Everyone was here together and because we wanted freedom, we wanted one thing and the people were united in that one thing. You know, I'm also looking at this one word, I think it, it, it resonates throughout this entire museum, is the word volunteers. I mean, you know, you look at, you look at the country now and I mean, we've got career politicians that are still striving to, to achieve a lot of the, yeah. the goals of this charter, but here we're a bunch of volunteers. Yeah. You know, a group of dedicated South Africans for, for all intents and purposes. It wasn't a job to do yeah. it. It was, it was really There's, a was passion no for it and we wanted to do it. Then you think about the difficulty that they had, but the perseverance they also had to come together and lay the foundation of, of what it means to be a free South African back in 1955. I think it's, it's phenomenal. Actually, I get goosebumps just being in this space. What do you think it means to be free? So they, they fought for us, but I mean, what does it mean? What did they fight for? What is what did the volunteers and, and what does this charter in essence like come to? I think at the end of the day, um, freedom is being able to make your own choices. I remember before this charter was drawn up, a, a majority of the people, um, choices were forced upon them. Um, do this, do that, go here, go here. You can't go here, you can't go here, you can't live here, you live here. Um, so I think now, essentially, especially in South Africa, I think what we should celebrate is we're free to make our own choice now. Now you can decide to go wherever, live wherever, do what you want. Make a choice. I think the concept of freedom means different things to different people in, in different situations. Freedom is when people get liberated from any form of oppression. Freedom meant 
that uh, all South Africans, blacks and whites, should enjoy fundamental human rights. The apartheid system said that if you were black, you were not a full human being. You were subhuman. You knew exactly that you didn't have certain liberties. When bright young Dutch immigrant Hendrik Verwoerd took over the leadership of the National Party, he turned apartheid into an ideology. His laws required all South Africans to be classified according to race. In 1955, people of this country said was that South Africa should belong to all who live in it, black and white. And that was revolutionary. This historic document wanted freedom and democracy for all and declared that South Africa belonged to all its people, white and black. It was to replace white minority rule and oppression with freedom. It envisaged, if you like, uh, the black majority inheriting the political kingdom, but also acquiring uh, economic power, in which the people of South Africa would take control of some of the key economic resources, like the mines. You know, the, the Freedom Charter is not a constitution, nor is it a draft constitution. It was the program of the liberation movement. The Afrikanists opposed the Freedom Charter because it diluted the true nature of the struggle. It attempted to transform the struggle from one of national liberation to one of integration. There has been um, significant change in the build-up to the liberation, particularly with the ruling party and the options that were there. And the settlement, the nature of the settlement that we accepted during the period of the transition. There's Mr. Mandela, Mr. Nelson Mandela, a free man. After Nelson Mandela was released from prison, he went on a few roadworks throughout the world. Speaking to various leaders across the world, heads of state, big business, trying to get a sense of their plans for South Africa. A policy document was released called Ready to Govern, which basically changed the rhetoric from, you know, the original plan of what the ANC had, which was to nationalize state assets when they gained power. And he said, uh, guys, it's absolutely clear. We, if we go ahead with the radical socialist measures, we are going to find ourselves as isolated as Cuba, We've seen the Soviet Union collapse, and on this basis, we've got to change tack. It was due to the international community and the fact that there'd be punitive you know, measures that would have been, I guess, exercised against the country as a whole. We'd be ostracized, and I guess the sanctions as well might not have been lifted. What we had hoped for was a radical redistribution a state that would nationalize the industry, a state that would give the land back to, to the people. The native question was dealt with in the Union's first parliament. One of its first steps was to deprive Africans of most of their land with the Land Act of 1913. It is unparalleled in terms of disposition, how much, how much black people had been dispossessed. If you're of the view that uh, there should be nationalization of all the banks, you should vote for a party that when it gets elected, it would nationalize all the banks. But if the majority of South Africans don't vote for such a party, well then, you know, then they don't vote for such a party. The state is expected to give people political liberties. Economic freedom would extend to actually giving people, ordinary poor people, the resources to uh, achieve the basic things, the basic goals that they want to achieve in life. But if you talk about economic freedom, you talk about independence that people have. Basically, a significant amount of people within the country that do not have significant freedom to decide and to be independent and have their own economic will and decide where to stay. Living in squalor, she still clings on to the promise of a vote in 1994. <laughs> Today you can live in a house in Santon if you wish, you can live in Cape Town, but for the majority of black people, it's not viable. But socioeconomic rights can only be realized if there's a political will to realize them. So the constitution provides, if you like, a kind of resource that can be used 
by those who want to push for more progressive changes. The values of the constitution, I think, are achievable. The constitution is not as radical as it was supposed to do, but it will end in enforcing the people's, I mean, the, the rights to dignity. Some people consider uh, elements of the constitution idealistic in the sense that it is a, it is also a long-term vision. We have provisions within the constitution that state that people have rights to water, sanitation, you know, resources that the state is supposed to be providing. However, how many of these people within our country actually get, you know, those sort of provisions that they've been promised through the constitution? Section 26 when you so-called powerful constitution say everybody's got the right to have access to decent, adequate housing. If it was intended that the constitution could be implemented, say, everything could happen in five years' time, it wouldn't contain real transformatory stuff which takes a much longer time to happen. You know, looking at the Freedom Charter and what it stands for, we still have a very long way to go before we can really say South Africa is free, free. that everyone is free. It's come, become very frequent where people say, we should be there already. But 20 years compared to 300 plus years, it's and difficult. And I don't think, and, and I think it's a mindset thing. And I think that um, a lot of people in South Africa need to realize that, yes, we needed a liberation movement and we needed a liberating party, but now our movement shouldn't be about liberation anymore. It should be about the leading next phase, now. The next it's, it's, phase. It should be a leading phase. It's, it's a 300-year-old yeah. journey. And I'm just looking at the 10 sort of pillars of the Freedom Charter here. And I think we can't say that just before the charter was, was drawn up, so pre 1955, that suddenly when South Africa had Everything mass inequality. Yeah. You know, it's been going on for 300 yeah. years. And I can understand that it takes a long time to redress 300 yeah. years of institutionalized yeah. oppression. oppression and yeah. inequality. I haven't been here before. Why haven't we? Why yeah. haven't all South Africans been here? And I think especially on Freedom Day, it shouldn't be just a public holiday. I think yeah. somehow you need to get to a point where you realize, let me connect again. Let me um, look up the Freedom Charter, the Constitution, because this is what it's about. The, the Freedom Charter and the Constitution gets quoted sometimes when you're feeling nostalgic or whatever, but it should be a way of living. It should be, it should be inherently there every day. If you talk about the freedom struggle, it started from the first day that South Africa was occupied. The idea of freedom should be seen in the light of more than 300 years of dispossession. The basic issue was political, was territory. And many African indigenous polities fought vigorously against it. You know, were it not for the superior weaponry that the colonialists used, I think the battle would have gone the other way. There was never a time when the conqueror could say, we've conquered, we've now subjugated the people, and we're in power, and that's it. There was never, there was never a moment's rest for the oppressor, and the oppressed people fought all along. Having been overcome by the colonialists because of their superior weapons, mobility and firepower, the African people correctly decided to resist the unholy alliance. The British, however, cottoned on to the Cape's strategic importance. In the late 1800s, diamonds were discovered in Kimberley and gold on the Witwatersrand. And then with the discovery of diamonds and discovery of gold, there was a, a, a big need for labor on the mines, but black people were not accustomed to going and working for somebody else and uh, they had to force a situation, force people to work on the mines. And the way to do that was to impose all sorts of taxes on people, and the only way people could pay their taxes if they were earning wages. We all know migrant laborers, the majority of them came from homesteads, left their families and came into urban areas in search of work. 22 years after democracy, hostels are still associated with poverty, neglect, crime and tribalism.
it led to a large-scale destruction of the fabric of societies and of families. If you look at places like Soweto, for instance, these were places where initially migrants used to live just to get access into the city in Johannesburg. And through that, and urbanization and more people coming in, townships were developed. So it's affected our people in the sense that they've never really been part of the economy. It led to the deliberate disempowering of the majority of South Africa's population. The Bantu Education Act. This is one of apartheid's most offensively racist laws. They were to receive an education designed to provide them with skills to serve their own people in the Bantustan homelands or to work in manual labor jobs under white control. So a deliberate denial of education, a deliberate denial of opportunities as such, so as to make it impossible for black people to compete with the white minority. Black people in general are still very much poor, they're still very much under, uh, under marginalized and we need to find a way of creating a more equal society. Well the constitution itself envisages a, a kind of economic justice. It, it indicates a basic set of rights in areas like uh, education, housing, access to health and water and it indicates a direction in which it expects the political elites of the country to be moving, to be showing evidence of moving rationally and purposively towards uh, those goals uh, within available resources. Now what have we actually achieved in terms of uh, economic justice in this country? Well we've, there have been gains. So uh, for example we have uh, the social grants providing a, a safety net. For one, in as much as we've experienced a lot of corruption throughout the country, the government should be commended for a few things that they've done right. And the first, I'd say, was providing housing for our people. The South African government has done so much in regards to uh, creating economic justice. However, we are facing a problem with the implementation. If we continue with the softer stance that we currently have, we are not going to see the transformative powers of the Triple Green Act that we're supposed uh, to be seeing. Males who are white and are a very, very small minority occupy the big chunk of South Africa's economy. It's a policy thing. It's a constitutional matter to a limited extent in the sense that the constitution must enable uh, or not prevent economic justice as such. The state introduced that to ensure economic participation by Africans or by blacks in South Africa. Although that has significant limitations because there has not been eff effective implementation of BEE. It has been captured by the political elite. So there is there's a push for um, a restoration of black people uh, to their land and culture, but of course uh, precisely what that means is heavily contested. Uh, there are some people who essentially understand that to involve enabling black people to share in the fruits of modern life as they've evolved in South Africa, where some other people have got a much more radical idea of completely overturning modernity and perhaps returning to some romantic, vaguely, nostalgically reconstructed idea of what the past was like. Land goes far big, uh, far deeper than mere economic value to, to any African. Land is home to an African. And African people, you can go anywhere, are attached to land spiritually, psychologically, culturally, and, and otherwise. And I think that's uh, futile. We're not going to be able to go back to some pre-colonial nirvana because uh, that, that's been irreversibly uh, transcended for better and for worse. When dispossession occurred and African land was being alienated on a massive scale, especially in Southern Africa, African people lost their identity and their being. None of these questions have a straightforward answer. Um, and uh, the land question is a very, very important question in South Africa. It's not sustainable that such vast portions of the land are owned 
by white people and that black people have access, don't have access to it. It's not a sustainable thing. And it's for that reason that it has to change. Change can't happen overnight, fair enough. But through stages of development, especially for young democracies such as ourselves, we need to have a look at what we've achieved. We need to reevaluate what could have been done, um, what could have, I guess, been introduced as far as creative strategies to make the lives of our ordinary South Africans better. We need government to support Africans financially and make sure that there is also significant support in terms of the skills, farming skills. So the best way forward entails providing education for the majority. Focusing on skills development initiatives would be very important. And obviously universities of technology um, play a key role and your former colleges because that's where the majority of our people would find you know, these skills, I guess, courses and initiatives that would provide them with the skills to provide some kind of livelihood for themselves and family. It's really interesting being in this space now. You know, in, in the past, it was a, almost a, a, a citadel of minority power. You know, it is so ironic that, you know, thinking what this place was back then and what it's become now in terms of it also um, pushing the agenda of the rule of law and making people more aware of the role of the judiciary. Celebrating Freedom Day and democracy, what does that mean for us? What is democracy? You know, for me, uh, democracy is more of a concept. A concept that had to be envisioned, a concept which has not uh, being practicalized. We want to speak about democracy. We believe we're in a democracy. 23 years down the line, people are still struggling. People have not reached or envisioned what it is that they thought this democracy would have. But that's not a long time though, 23 years. Why um, are we making excuses for the government? We're not making excuses. What I want to ask you is, do you think the reason why everyone doesn't have a firm grasp on this idealistic idea that is democracy, do you think that's because our government has not yet realized that they should move now from being a liberation movement or a liberation party, mm -hmm. which they were, to being a leading party. What do you think led to uh, economic inequality? I mean, we have a conversation here, we speak of the fact that uh, were we so obsessed about having democracy that we didn't look at economic emancipation? Uh, you know, drafters of the Freedom Charter, at least, envisioned a country where everyone was equal in terms of their rights, not necessarily in terms of their income. I think it's one thing to complain about the government a lot of the time, yeah. but active citizenship is probably the most important thing and that's what freedom means for me. It's about having duties in terms of a constitution. As a citizen, yeah. you don't just have rights. You and have that, was, that was very important. I think um, it was important to establish the foundation, which was the democracy. Out of mm. the democracy will now stem social equality, economic um, justice, and all the other aspects. But if we didn't have the foundation, I don't think we would have even gone to where we are now, 23 years down the Do line. Do you think the people who were there in the writing of the Constitution, the leaders who are still alive now, have abandoned the ship in actually getting the people the equality that they need. What are they doing? They the question is are, they what are, they leaving, doing? Are, are, are they living ostentatious lives mm. now that they've forgotten? I think that's very subjective. I don't think they. I don't think they left. I don't think if you were, if you gave your everything in in being there to form the constitution, that you could ever abandon something like that. I think the point that I want to come back to is. Opinions have changed, views have changed. Are they still fighting the fight? Because we still are fighting a fight. It's not like we would hands down. It creates like, a divide of us and yeah. them where we can't relate to our leaders yeah. anymore. I mean, have we been so enshrined by corruption or collusion yeah. that yeah. we're not actually dealing with the, the issues of the day? Corruption isn't now. Corruption has been been there. It's just it's more I, think, blatant. I think what is what we need to value and understand is that we now know about it. Is because of, of our media? because our, of our democracy, we are now in the know. The behavior and the conduct of our leaders has increasingly deteriorated. 
some of our leaders, I, I, I should say. There are people, good people in the government, there are people who have, uh, you know, the needs of the people at heart. There are people who are willing to contribute to a better South Africa within government departments. However, these people and these voices are being stunted by, you know, our corrupt officials. Kikaba says 1,700 public servants have been dismissed for corruption since September 2004. Chapter 9 is cooperating with the executive, the executive cooperating with the judiciary and with parliament to ensure that there is a seamless state. Now the constitution does itself provide mechanisms that can check and balance that to some degree. But what those checks and balances have not been able to uh, prevent is a very large amount of corruption and mismanagement and I'm afraid it's going to be left to South Africans politically to challenge that. We have seen deterioration in terms of how people who hold high office, you know, I mean, conduct themselves. The remedial action taken by the public protector against President Jacob Gedeleki Zuma in terms of Section 182.1c of the Constitution is binding. Well, when Hani said in 1992 that he feared that political leaders would become elitist, I think it was a, a justifiable concern and it was a justified concern. And I don't think he was the only one. Our leaders have forgotten why they're there. They are now there to, like Chris Hani said, uh, they're staying in palaces. Unfortunately, history teaches us that what's happening in South Africa is, is not a new phenomenon. In the sense that, look at Africa for example. We're one of the, I guess, more modern democracies, if you will. But across Africa, there are you know, wars and so forth, governments being toppled, um, and political strife. So we're not unique in experiencing this transition as a difficult period. If you look at the countries that emerged from uh, communism, uh, they all are under, uh, experiencing uh, difficulties. If you, looked at, if you look at the countries that uh, emerged from the colonial experience in uh, Africa, but also from the transition to democracy in Africa at the beginning of the 1990s, uh, many of these countries find that uh, democracy can be a struggle. For us, I guess the advantage that we have is the fact that we still have a society uh, that is very much, I guess, uh, held intact by our constitution and the rule of law obviously being our core and founding principle. A lot of people feel that democracy hasn't delivered what it promised to do, what people expected to do. And in consequence, we are living through an age of democratic disappointment. It's by no means uh, a uniquely South African phenomenon to experience democracy as um, a difficult time. After all, freedom can be a burden as well as an opportunity. <laughs> what is democracy? Democracy is a highly <laughs> elusive term. Look, it means many things to many people, you know. It's one of those sorts of words where if somebody doesn't like what you're doing, they'll say you're not being democratic. And then it sounds like, wow, how can you not be democratic? But, uh, so it's, it's an over-traded, over-used word. It's a rule of the commoner. Democracy gives an ordinary person, a citizen of the country, the right to vote. Democratic countries regularly go to elections so that people exercise their right to choose. Every adult South African regardless of race, regardless of gender, should have the right to exercise a free vote in regular elections for a party of his or her choice without fear or favor in a free and fair election. That's democracy. I think a lot of people expect democracy to be something that instantly delivers the good life. But that's not what democracy is. Uh, democracy provides people with powers and mechanisms to themselves work towards a better kind of life. I suppose the most important thing for people is to is political freedoms, that you don't want somebody to treat you badly just because, you, because of the color of your skin. 
I mean, you want the right to choose your own government, and you want to be able to have uh, a decent living. That's what you want. You want you want to have an income that allows you to have a dignified lifestyle. I think sharing the land and sharing in the country's wealth is what South Africans want and is what South Africans need. We need good governance. We need accountability from our leadership. And when I say accountability, I mean that we need leaders who are going to say, this is not how things are done. We need our leaders to step up and say, enough is enough. One of the key steps is to, in fact, make sure that we have strategies in place. Not to say that nationalization would not work per se, but in an economic sense, it doesn't make sense from an efficiency point of view. But let's say for argument's sake, nationalization worked. We assume that. What can we put in place to ensure that everyone benefits from that? Now that's a tough question. Are we gonna put an empowerment fund, for instance? So there are many different values, interests, aspirations in the country. Most of us would agree that it would be a good thing if the sheer level of inequality in the country between the, the rich and the poor were to be uh, seriously uh, reduced. What are human rights? Well, how do you identify mm. the, the term? Maybe, maybe let's start there. What are human rights for you? For me, Inherently, I believe that your human rights, you can feel. It's a moral compass for you. Do you think human rights are taught or how does one uh, encompass them, one understand How do you know what your rights are? With great yeah, power the, the comes, comes great, great responsibility. responsibility. Um, no, well, I mean, there comes a set of, of rights that you have that cannot be taken away from you, but with that come a set of responsibilities that govern yeah. how you use those rights. Because yeah. everyone has the right, everyone has these human rights, because you are human, you, you just have them, like you say, you were born with them. It doesn't work like that because 300 years ago, 100 years ago, before we had our democracy, children were born into this country and they thought, because it was the law, they thought that they're not allowed to go to that school in Sandton. So and, they, and they accepted and they didn't know that it's a basic right for them. So I think rights is something you need to be taught. It's a process. It's, a, it's an understanding and it's, it's a learnership that everyone has to go through. Do you think it's linked to human dignity? Ensuring that they are proud to be a South African, they are aware of their rights and that no one will infringe on the human dignity because I think if you take that away... Mm. You've hit the nail on the head that human rights are the tangible manifestation of what human dignity requires in order to be, to be. But then what do you think should still be done in our country for us to actually get to a point where we say that uh, we are living, breathing this democracy, uh, enjoying our human rights. Well, what more can be done? We've come a long way. We've come the 300 years, we've come the past 23 years for democracy. But I mean, so we've, we've come a long way. More needs to be done. But we Do have you think we, we, we need more accountability? Yes, absolutely. Accountability from everyone. It's not just the people that are fighting the fight, Definitely. that are now accountable or were accountable. It's our responsibility to take it further and to also join the fight, to so also you're be volunteers. We need a collective responsibility to understand, yes. unpack and live. Yes, yeah. a bill of responsibilities. And a, That's what we need. A bill of responsibilities and a push for active citizenship because it's one thing to have this bill of responsibilities, but if everyday people, you know, us sitting at this table, yeah. everyone around us, if yeah. we're not working every day to ensure that those are protected, it means nothing. We are not having a conversation about what dignity is and our fellow South Africans don't understand dignity either. We have a problem. Yeah. The Bill of Rights is, is both a legal instrument, but it's also at the same time something that embodies the soul of the nation and a vision of the kind of society we want to become. The traditional categorization of human rights ranges from the first or the rights, for instance, the political and the civil rights. The right to stand and vote in elections, 
the right to, to freely associate politically, but also a range of civil rights, like the right to choose your occupation, the right to choose who you're going to uh, marry, etc. Uh, and, and the equality of access to those rights. Second generation rights have got more to do with, the, with social provision, with the actual uh, empowerment of people by providing uh, uh, the public and especially the poor with the resources that they need to be effective in their lives, to be effective in their personal lives and to be effective politically. When it comes to third uh, and fourth generation rights, it, different people have different de definitions, but broadly speaking, these further generations of rights in, in, in encompass such uh, things as uh, an idea of environmental protection, the idea of uh, recognition, mutual recognition in terms of recognition of each other's uh, cultures and ways of life and so on. I mean, although political rights and civic rights are fundamental, but that cannot go without I mean, economic freedom, for instance, social rights as well, you know, that, 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 and the cultural rights. That those have to come together. And of course, at the level now of a nation, group rights, for instance, are very important in identity of a nation, you know, and they're all intertwined. The most important part of the Constitution is the Bill of Rights. It gives us all political rights, like the right to vote and protest. It also gives us socioeconomic rights, like housing. Twenty years later, many socio-economic rights have not been fully realised and millions of people remain without adequate housing, education and healthcare. The Constitution has not reversed 300 years of discrimination. The Bill of Rights is not just another statute or another act. It's not just a set of rules. And you shouldn't reduce it to something like traffic regulations. So the Bill of Rights uh, affirms the right of, of uh, South Africans to uh, dignity. Precisely what dignity means is uh, something uh, we can debate, but it has a long history in, uh, for example, political philosophy. Freedom Day has opened up what was close to us before. It's a, it has now made me feel as an equal human being. What we gained is dignity, dignity as human beings, because apartheid had robbed us of, the, of, of our dignity as equal human beings. Dignity is about respecting the humanity in another person. It's respect for a human being. You respect their mind, their body, and their spirit. But the question of how legislation itself can uh, restore the dignity of, of human beings um, it can do it in part by giving people resources uh, in the form of uh, houses, in the form of um, a social safety net. Our people's dignity somewhat has been restored in the sense that our people now have, I guess, the opportunity to be provided with a, you know, a state house, for example, through our RTP, you know, housing program. In order to achieve that uh, fuller sense of dignity, people need, uh, for example, work, they need jobs, uh, and, and so on, uh, which too many people don't have access to in South Africa. Government has the necessary funds, they've allocated the monies, and we have a huge budget, um, relatively speaking. But now the question is, how do we actually make sure that the funds that we have in place are, are used in the best possible means? to, I guess, enrich the lives of our people. Zan, so if you could touch, see, feel freedom, what would it be and what would it look like? For me, freedom is the opportunity. It's the opportunity of taking grasp of what your rights really are, you know, making decisions and, and, and living life free. And do you think we have freedom at this point in time? <laughs> That's very debatable, Andile. <laughs> um, I would love to say I, I think we have reached our full potential of freedom and dignity and human rights, but I think we can go further. 
Mm. Definitely. There's, there's room for improvement. Let's leave it there. Duran, you could touch, see, feel. Freedom. How would freedom look to you? I think for me, it's, it's probably going to be your, your, your favorite childhood memory. Yeah. Right? The warmth, the security. I mean, provided you security, did have a yeah. very good yeah. upbringing. The warmth, the security, the comfort of knowing, or rather not knowing what the evils yeah. of the world were. Yeah. Yeah. That's what freedom is. Which freedom <laughs> fighter speaks to you? Um, you know, just going, going from, from what I've just said, I think the maternal instinct of Lillian and Goy, you know, being a strong, passionate woman yeah. that, that led and galvanized, and galvanized, yeah. gal galvanized a, a sector of society that was never Allowed. taken seriously. That was yeah. never taken seriously. Call, call a spade a spade. Mm. Never taken seriously to galvanize them and, and march to Pretoria and demand right. a right it is something that resonates quite deeply with me. And if we were to sum up freedom for us as we approach Freedom Day, what would we say? Should people be excited for yes, it? Yes, let's be excited. I mean, we're yes, celebrating yes, 23 yes, years. Yes, but let's not forget that, you know, we had a struggle. Okay. And where, where our 23 years and our 300 years is. And, and let's bring it back to that and say, let's not let the next 20 years or 300 years be yeah. wasted. Yeah. Let's bring it back to what we should also be doing. So we're saying more still needs to be done, but yes. we should also be cognizant yeah. of the gains that we've yeah, made. Definitely, yeah. we should we should definitely the celebrate, but mm. also internally motivate ourselves to do better. Yeah. We have to do and, better. And, and strive for the future. So I think it's always going to be a work in progress, but we shouldn't lose sight of what we've achieved thus Because far. this freedom did not come easy. Yeah. It, it did didn't. Not, and and people, people fought and died People for paid it. the highest price for it, actually. And, and they paid it here. They paid it here at Constitutional yeah. Hill. That's what I think they that's the best, the best part, um, is that it will always be a work in progress. Because we yeah. can never say we're there. Because we've, if we get to this idealistic place of what we're there, what are we going to do next? Mm -hmm. What is there to improve on? Mm -hmm. So it's always going to be a work in, pro in process, but we need to we need to be willing to do that and be happy about and should doing be, that. And we should be proud that we've come this far. We should, absolutely. Yeah. I'm not of the view that freedom is an event. That we say, okay, if we do boop, 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 the following things, we fulfill all of them, then we are free. Finish and clear. We can all go home, it's done, and fold our arms and, you know, relax. There's no such thing. The most important thing is for our people to know that they're not helpless, for one. Uh, because our constitution provides uh, freedoms. Freedom really evolves uh, because, because human beings and, their, and, and human culture evolves as such. And this is going to mean that we continually have to look at our constitutional order and our country and talk about how can we improve it all of the times. We can empower our people by, first of all, educating them about the fact that they don't necessarily have to accept, you know, everything that happens to them. So by that I mean, for an example, if you live in deep slit and you're not being provided with the necessary services that government has promised you to provide the basic services, you have the right to complain through various channels. You have the right to sit down with your ward councillor and ask him to call a meeting where, you know, the issues affecting the community will be tabled and discussed. The issue of governance is what's hindering our freedom. The issue of um, transparency, accountability is what. So we need to get to a point where society, this includes our leaders, but not only them, but you and I on the streets as well need to be accountable every single day of our lives for the country that we live in. We have a brilliant constitution. It needs to be understood. It needs, people need to be encouraged to read and understand their rights and, and demand their rights as, as, as well. South Africans, uh, I think, are committed to a certain idea of freedom and they aspire to freedom and they have shown themselves willing uh, where they are treated particularly badly by the state or some other actor to rise up and to to protest. The good is that it shows active citizenship. It shows that South Africans are conscious of rights and, and seek to fight for them. But at the same time it can be seen as 
um, a sign that some of the mechanisms of representative democracy are not working as well as they should. People feel that government is unresponsive. And uh, in that context, when people do rise up, they often rise up in a kind of an explosive and destructive way. I don't think that it's all gloom and doom. We're moving towards the right direction. Protest and people demanding their rights is part of democracy. People's voices must be heard. And we have to make sure that those are the pillars that define our democracy and that define our, our, our constitution and that define us as a nation. Rights goes with responsibilities. You draw your rights from the constitution, but you have a responsibility to your fellow citizens. And I think it will be a shame if we turn ourselves into kind of an individualist country where you say your neighbor's suffering has got nothing to do with you. Now the constitution says your right must be respected, but also you should respect the rights of others. We have a responsibility to respect each other. We have a responsibility to act in a way that is ethical and that shows that, that respects dignity of, of, of other people. And we have a responsibility to speak the truth to power. That is one of our responsibilities as, as citizens. We have a, a working democracy of sorts. We've, we've made genuine gains in terms of provision of social grants, water, electricity, housing. What this country has achieved on housing is just one of the modern miracles. There's, there's, I don't know of any other country that's built so many houses and given them, them away free of charge to poor people. It's just a minor miracle that's happened. There is a lot we can derive hope from. You know, we have a vibrant young generation that grew up not under apartheid and they are challenging things and they seem to be showing strong leadership. We have a lot of positive issues to, to look at and our country is very rich. You know, we've got, uh, I mean, we have mineral resources that are unparalleled to most parts of, of the world. And we, as a nation, uh, I mean, have shown the world that we can have a vibrant constitution, you know, and we have a strong judiciary but has the promise of a free South Africa where everyone can enjoy the benefit of being a South African and where everyone, I guess more importantly from an economic standpoint, feels a part of the economy and can play an active part. Has that been achieved? I'm not so sure. In order to build and develop our country, we need to deal with the challenges that are facing us. One of the key challenges that are facing us are the racial divisions of the past. 2015 ended on a sour note, with several high-profile racist posts on social media grabbing international headlines. Better says acceleration of land redistribution is the only long-term solution to simmering racial tension in the country. So part of what the Constitution envisages is a, is a nation-building exercise in South Africa. Uh, and that's part of what the Freedom Charter envisaged as well, the idea that South Africans could uh, unify across uh, racial lines, uh, for example, and come to think of themselves as part of a, a common endeavour. And I think that uh, there's worrying evidence that we're not really achieving that. We're not really achieving a, a sense of common purpose and we're not achieving a common identity, in part because of the, the, the level of frustration that currently exists about uh, the uh, economic failure, about persistence of uh, inequality. I don't think that the nation building project is a doomed project. I think that uh, there are many South Africans who, are, across different racial groups, really want South Africa to succeed as a project. Because at the end of the day, it's not the law, it's not the constitution, it's not the members of parliament or the state president that will make this a better place. It's you and I and ordinary people and the citizens that will make it a better place. You can have the best laws, but if the people are horrible, we'll be a horrible place. And so we must continually try to become better people and promote human solidarity.
but we are going to liberate them from that state of psychological and mental imprisonment. The, our struggle is going to do that because our struggle is, is positive. It's, a, it's, it's liberating. It's liberating all South Africans. It's liberating the blacks. It's liberating the whites. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's bringing freedom uh, and, and friendship and, uh, to, to all, black and white. Oh, oh.